Welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Dr. Jessica Wirtz, a specialty care physician for Innova Sports Medicine. We're here to discuss sports injuries and concussions, helping athletes return to play. Welcome, Dr. Wirtz. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're excited to have you here. I know previously you have served as a team physician for Ohio State, McDaniel College, Mount St. Mary's, um, and you deal with the prevention and management of all types of sports injuries like concussions. Um, and I know you engage in osteopathic manipulation, musculoskeletal ultrasound. Talk to me a little bit, if you can, Dr. Wirtz, about some of the types of sports injuries you encounter in your practice. Yeah, so we see a wide variety of sports injuries head to toe, literally. <laughs> so um, any kind of injury that you can sustain, we see it, but not just sports injuries. We also see um, arthritis and concussions. Um, we do procedures, um, ultrasound guided uh, injections, um, orthobiologics, such as which we can talk about more later. Um, using platelets and stem cells. Um, I work with orthopedic surgeons. So if you need surgery, you know, we have my colleagues are right here in house. We try to try to streamline our care as well, just because everybody works together under one roof. So are you often one of the first points of contact for an athlete who comes in, has some kind of injury are you the first person they visit or do they often go to their primary care physician and you, they get referred to you? That's a good question. So, you know, unless the patient is um, aware of our specialty, um, usually they're going to their primary care or the emergency department or urgent care. Um, and those practices usually will refer to our office. And then we are usually the gatekeepers of the initial injuries coming in and making the diagnosis, um, evaluating them, making the diagnosis and treatment and seeing if it is something that needs surgical evaluation or further care. And, and you're helping make those determinations as far as um, if they need more advanced special care, if they need to refer to a surgeon or any other kind of specialist. So you're sort of that Absolutely. next kind of intent. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I kind of decide, is it something that I can manage and treat them conservatively without surgical management? Or is it something that we need to kind of send on to our sur surgery counterparts to manage? Yeah, absolutely. And when you see patients coming into your office, um, how long are they with you? How, um, how much time does it take for you to provide a diagnosis and a treatment plan and get them back on their feet to return to play? So the initial visit for a new patient, I typically can take up to 30 minutes, you know, in my evaluation um, and coming up with a treatment plan for them. And it kind of varies, you know, injury to injury on how long they continue to see me back for. Um, you know, if it's a very straightforward injury, it could just be, you know, a, a couple visits. If it's something more significant, you know, it could be drawn out over the course of months. Um, so it just kind of depends. Um, even though I'm not like your typical primary care physician, you know, I don't have, you know, regular patients per se. I ultimately do end up seeing patients back regularly, you know, because people continue to get injuries and, you know, sustain um, whatever, you know, it is, whether it's a degenerative disease like arthritis, you know, I'll end up seeing them at some point down the road because I build that trust with them. And so they know to come back and see me. You mentioned earlier uh, orthobiologic injections, and I understand that this is, is really using um, a person's own biology to help heal them. Can you describe that in a little more detail? Sure. So one of the ones that I use most commonly is called PRP. So PRP is short for platelet-rich plasma. And so essentially what we're doing is we're drawing a patient's own blood um, and we're spinning it down in a centrifuge and we separate the platelets. Um, we don't draw a lot of blood. It's usually about maybe 15 milliliters of blood. Um, and we tend to get maybe five milliliters of platelets um, out of that. And we can use that um, to inject for arthritis, you know, the treatment of arthritis or 
chronic tendon injuries, and it can also help speed up healing um, for a lot of patients, even though technically we can't quote that it creates this amazing healing process. We have seen some really great clinical results with our professional athletes, all the way down to you know, the, the elderly patient with arthritis um, who's trying to put off having a, a knee replacement. Um, it does create a healing cascade of cell factors to help promote that kind of healing process. Um, it's not gonna fix your arthritis, but it may help improve pain and function and get you back to play sooner for those more acute injuries that we see. And then the PRP process is that often used for issues with arthritis and similar symptoms, or is it a technology that's used for broader purposes? Definitely broader purposes. Like I said, we do even use it on our um, professional athletes to get them back to play sooner. Um, It does help kind of improve pain and function when, you know, an athlete has sustained, for example, a a muscle injury or a, a tendon injury. You know, when we're trying to promote, um, you know, improvement and healing, that healing cascade, we can help kind of use this product in addition to like physical therapy and rehab to get them back on the field faster. And you also use ultrasound um, guided injections as well. Talk to me a little bit about this process and what purpose it serves. So using an ultrasound helps guide your accuracy of making sure that you get, you know, whatever you're injecting or aspirating, um, you know, making sure that you're not going to injure structures like, you know, vessels, (laughs) nerves, (laughs) Um, you know, making sure you get what you're trying to accomplish, making sure you get that needle in the right spot. Because if you don't have that ultrasound guidance, you know, we're just, you kind of go off your, you know, surface anatomy, which is pretty good for the most part. But there have been studies that show, you know, using your surface anatomy versus using an ultrasound that that obviously ultrasound is going to be more accurate because you can actually visualize the needle going where it needs to go. And you're putting, whether it's steroid or the PRP or your aspirating fluid um, out of a joint space or wherever, you you make sure you're doing what you went into accomplish. And you're not going to injure any other surrounding structures. You can identify the vessels and nerves and make sure that you're not going to hit those structures. It's a pretty amazing um, non-invasive process to use ultrasound to really increase the accuracy and um, reduce further injury and pain and suffering. So it's pretty incredible. Uh, Talk to us a little bit about the compartment syndrome. I know this is caused by injury. Um, or intense exercise and it causes swelling and pressure in nerves and muscles. Um, Often sports with repetitive movements like biking, running, and swimming are particular risks. So how do you encounter compartment syndrome as a particular issue and what do you do to solve this problem? So there's a difference between acute compartment syndrome and exercise-induced compartment syndrome. And I think the exercise-induced compartment syndrome is one that is commonly Um, misdiagnosed as, for example, shin splints or stress fractures or muscle injury, and and people don't, aren't really aware of it. So, um, you know, I, I see a handful of this, these cases every month in my, in my clinic. And oftentimes these athletes are coming to me um, with pain and their lower legs just with exercise. And they have been having symptoms for years and it has gotten to the point where it has prevented them from being able to exercise because the pain is so significant, which can be life changing for, you know, somebody who's young and wants to be active. So when they come into my office, they're usually very frustrated. And a lot of times their symptoms present as pain, pressure that they describe as pressure that comes on usually within 10 minutes at the same time, every time, you know, usually with some sort of like running type activity. Um, Sometimes if they continue to push through the symptoms, they'll get like numbness and tingling or weakness in the legs. Um, But it does prevent them from continuing to be active. So we can put them through testing such as compartment testing, where it's a very large needle that we have to test their pressures in the leg because exertional um, compartment syndrome is, we don't know what causes it exactly. There are a lot of theories out there what causes it. Um, but it basically pulls swelling into the compartment spaces. We have four compartments that house our vessels, 
nerves and muscles in our lower legs. And so these, the fluid gets filled up and in, increases pressure that puts pressure on the nerves and the vessels and causes the symptoms in the legs. A lot of times we find that people have tight fascia in the lower legs or large muscles, and it tends to occur in sports that are doing a lot of running, jumping type activities. Um, but there is a treatment. Um, ultimately, if people don't improve with physical therapy and, and retraining the running, sometimes you need surgery. And that's something that we call a fasciotomy, where they basically have to slice open the fascia <laughs> and release that pressure. So, but people do really well with those surgeries. Unfortunately, you can have recurrence, um, but ultimately a lot of these patients, when it does work, it, they're very thankful to get back to being active again. Absolutely. Especially if they've been out of commission for a long time and they probably see some relief. Is that, is that relief immediate from this treatment that you provide? So not, not immediate. Um, they, they do get some, they won't usually be able to tell for sure, um, how, well, they will be able to feel until probably about three to four months out when they're able to start progressing back to their running exercise. Um, but they're usually working with physical therapy for the first couple of months, and then they'll gradually progress them to that, you know, getting back to running and they're able to generally progress back pain free, which is our goal. And I imagine you have a lot of empathy for athletes since you were a, a division one college gymnast at the University of Nebraska. Um, a letter winner for the Huskers from 2000 to 2003. You were an All-American on the vault where you posted two perfect tens during your career. Pretty impressive. And um, I know you suffered some ankle injuries that impacted your ability to um, compete. So what can you tell us about this personal experience and how this influenced how you practice sports medicine? Yeah, I think the nature of gymnastics, there's a lot of overuse injuries. And unfortunately, I, I did sustain a lot of ankle tweaks and just wear and tear on my body. Um, I think it kind of caught up with me my last year or two of college. And I had sustained a lot of ankle sprains and developed some impingement and, and bony spurs and ended up having surgery. Um, the nice thing about gymnastics, you got four events. So, you know, you can always swing the bars or do other things that are not as impactful. but um, I, I think I was happy with my career and I think having that experience of having, you know, an, an injury like that, that ended up in surgery, obviously it wasn't anything major. I think I got away pretty unscathed considering, you know, some of my other teammates who had more significant injuries. Um, but, you know, just spending the time in the training room and, and getting to know some of the team doctors and knowing their role with us. Um, really, I think, played a role in me deciding what I wanted to do as a career. And that influenced your, your trajectory. So it's interesting with sports medicine because you deal with a lot of things, a lot of injuries, but concussions are also very important. And it, it sounds like maybe that you don't have any personal experience with concussions, but you probably had teammates that experienced concussions and certainly you treat athletes who come in with concussions. Um, so talk to me a little bit about how you treat these patients. I know concussion is a bump, blow, or jolt that shakes the brain. It's really interesting that you don't even have to have a collision to the head in order to sustain a concussion. So how often are these things going undiagnosed and, and how do you diagnose them when they come to, come to you for care? Yeah, I think you and I both, when we were, you know, athletes and competing, I don't think I could tell you what a concussion was, you know, and I think it was something that you could just kind of work through. Um, but now, you know, I think the idea of concussion and, and identifying it and being uh, hyper aware of it is becoming more and more common. And I think that um, it does go undiagnosed. And I think that it is more prevalent than what we're seeing because people maybe are not educated on what the symptoms are. It's, the signs to look for. And I think we're becoming more aware because we are educating people. Um, obviously, the old thought of sitting in a dark room and isolating yourself is, you know, until your symptoms go away is not the, the best treatment. Um, it actually can make things worse. You know, um, when you kind of have an athlete who's used to being out there and being social and competing and being active for several hours a day, and you put them in a room and you take them away from that environment, obviously it can create a lot of emotional distress. Um, 
you know, they feel that self-isolation, you know, their self-esteem goes down, they fall into depression, they're falling behind in school, maybe because they're being held back from school, which creates a heightened level of anxiety. Uh, maybe it affects their sleep because they're used to working out, you know, two or three hours a day, and now they're not even able to exert that energy. So then they're not sleeping well, and their mood is going to be all over the place. So you know, for us, it's important to educate the athlete to try to regulate them and get them back to normal as soon as possible. Ideally within that, you know, right after 24 hours, as soon as they can tolerate it, getting back in a normal routine, sleep, hydration, eating well, starting to exercise. Um, and they tend to recover faster with that kind of approach. This is a real, a change in the way um, I think many people understand how to respond post-concussion. Um, you, you published an article about the importance of behavioral reg regulation following a concussion. So are these some of the, the recommendations that you provide to athletes um, to continue to stay active, keep a regular schedule? What, what other recommendations do you provide um, when they are seeking care post-concussion? The, our evaluation and treatment of concussion is so comprehensive that we basically have a team. And when you come in to see us for concussion, you'll initially see an athletic trainer who will do all the intake of your symptoms and how your injury happened and, and basically go through all the basics with you of that behavioral um, modification, you know, after your injury, which includes that hydration and sleep and getting back on a normal sleep schedule, such as going to bed at the same time, getting up at the same time, um, you know, and walking you through your symptoms to see if we need to do any further management, such as vestibular therapy. Sometimes there's different types of concussions and there's no two concussions that are alike. So you have to take it on a case by case basis. And we have a neuropsychologist on staff that comes in and evaluates the patient as well from, you know, a psychological aspect, you know, a neurobehavioral aspect. We do a lot of testing on these athletes. And as a medical advisor, you know, if a patient needs a referral for vestibular therapy, if they're having a lot of dizziness or headache, um, you know, we have a vestibular therapist on staff to help the patient um, work through some of their symptoms without using medication. But if it gets to the point where they may need medication, obviously it's the uh, medical advisor, I'll come in and kind of guide them through that process as well. So there's, there's again, every, there's no two concussions that are alike, but we kind of take a multidisciplinary approach to kind of take that specific concussion and try to identify which trajectory it's following so that we can treat that specific trajectory, meaning whether it's like a neck, an eye issue, um, if there's a lot of mood involvement or vestibular abnormalities that are contributing to their symptoms so that we can kind of hone in on the cause of their symptoms as a result of that con concussion. Because a concussion obviously is a very complex patho pathophysiological process. And it, it sounds like when a concussion happens, a patient needs to get in front of an educated doctor um, as soon as possible, but I imagine there are a lot of patients, particularly with a milder case of a concussion or those who live in more rural areas and don't have access to um, medical professionals, they may not get the care that they need. So what advice do you have for those who don't see a doctor within 24 hours, 48 hours of their initial concussion? Um, what advice do you have for those individuals? So I think, you know, majority of mild concussion injuries actually don't need to be evaluated within that period of time unless their symptoms are really escalating. For example, if they're really starting to get, you know, significantly nauseous, vomiting, severe dizziness, headaches that are worsening, you know, um, maybe not controlled with an initial pain medications, although we tend not to recommend long-term pain medications for concussion management. But, um, but if the symptoms overall are escalating, then yes, that could be something that's an emergency. We can't rule out like a brain bleed or something like that. And that should be evaluated at the emergency department. But if the symptoms are pretty steady, you know, and that maybe they're just not feeling well, but they're not like getting a worsening headache, you know, or they're not vomiting and feeling just completely miserable, it's certainly something you can kind of sit tight, like, you know, try to 
get your rest, hydrate, eat well. And generally, we like to see them within, you know, a couple days and not necessarily right away because we kind of want those initial symptoms to kind of calm down to kind of see where they're at. Because sometimes it's hard for us to do the testing we need to do when they're not feeling so hot. And we don't want to make them feel worse by putting them through some of our testing. So I generally, I think a general rule is just to kind of see what your symptoms are initially. And if they're really getting significant and getting worse, then yes, it's always important to get evaluated at the emergency department. Um, we are fortunate enough to have a concussion hotline so that patients can call that hotline and speak with a nurse or speak with an athletic trainer if they're not sure whether they need to go to the emergency room and we can walk them through that process. Wow. And is that hotline available um, 24 hours a day or they, do they operate normal during normal business hours? So it is available 24 hours a day. However, during the nighttime hours, I think it cuts off like around nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, you leave a message and somebody will get back to you first thing in the morning, usually around 7 a.m. Even on the weekends, they're available. Wow. So. I know around 12% of youth athletes uh, sustain concussions, and this is a really critical time for youth when their brains are developing. Some of the sports that cause the greatest risk of concussions are ice hockey, tackle football, lacrosse for boys, and soccer for girls. Do you notice a trend for certain sports where you treat athletes um, with greater frequency for concussions? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I would say football, soccer, wrestling. Um, these are generally the more common sports lacrosse in, in this area on the East Coast we see a lot of. Um, so definitely those um, higher impact contact sports that, you know, are going up against a defender. You know, people are being very aggressive, especially in, the, in a game situation. We tend to see more um, of these contact and even non-contact injuries that can occur. Do you notice a pattern um, for any kind of injuries, not just concussions, but a pattern with um, males versus females, other types of sports, certain ages? Um, are there any patterns that you've been able to notice as far as people who are more susceptible to injuries or concussions um, that you've witnessed in your practice? Yeah, I would say, you know, in terms of like male versus female, I, I think we tend to see more female athletes. Um, and, you know, I always question why that is. There has been some research done in that area. Um, you know, the thought is, are females more susceptible? Is there a hormonal component or something like that? But also, you know, you have to take in consideration, females might be more likely to report their symptoms than a male. So is it just the fact that they're reporting more often their symptoms than a male who might be trying to be tough and, and push through those symptoms because that's what ex is expected in our culture. So I think we have to keep that in mind as well in educating, again, athletes and um, coaches and and. and letting them know that the importance of not continuing to play through symptoms and how it could prolong recovery. And you mentioned that mental health can be impacted um, through injuries, through concussions, um, and you may have to refer patients out for um, additional care for their mental health. Um, it, this multi-care approach can be really, really important in your practice. So um, I would imagine that female athletes maybe are more comfortable often making reports of mental health issues as well. Have you noticed that in your, in your care that you've provided? Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's, you know, still a stereotype around about mental health. And um, I think people are used to living in a society that's very uh, high anxiety and so sometimes people don't recognize the symptoms and sometimes it comes out in a very physical, somatic way. And so we have to kind of identify it for them. But I think, you know, the trend has been that, you know, not always, but I think females tend to be more in tune with that emotional side and being able to identify what their feelings are. Um, or at least when we point it out, be more open to that, um, what they're experiencing and how it might be contributing to how they're feeling. Um, so definitely. And, and then, you know, using a, 
multi-team approach in, in managing those symptoms and making sure that you have, an, again, an educated staff of athletic trainers and coaches and um, sports psychologists um, and even a sports psychiatrist, you know, which is an up and coming field of medicine and, you know, having a, psychi a psychiatrist dedicated to just athletes because it is, it is a huge area of mental health uh, that kind of has gone unrecognized. And I think it's coming more to the forefront recently. Absolutely. So either the mental health can impact and, and, and increase the injury or the injury can um, cause the mental health problem that, that makes it complicated as well. And I know it can be even more difficult for coaches who may, when maybe athletes are participating in multiple sports. And so they have different coaches, different teams, and the coaches aren't aware of the frequency in which they are engaging in training and activity. Um, how complicated is that of a factor if athletes are playing in all these different sports in different places um, and they may not have that kind of um, unified team, if you will, that are helping support them and, and recognize when there's some kind of issue? Well, obviously that can um, cause a breakdown in communication. If, if an athlete's participating in multiple sports and, you know, nobody's on the same page in, in terms of their, you know, training. And um, I think the athlete could get lost in the shuffle, you know, and, and that can create issues for um, making sure that that athlete has time uh, to recover. Um, it could contribute to burnout, depression, anxiety, because they're trying to meet the expectations of all these different coaches and areas of sport because everything in our culture is focused on winning and comp competition versus you know just the skill skills itself and skill development and i think that's the key here is that we focus on skill development and not focus always on winning for these athletes and making sure that you know everyone who's involved with that athlete whether it be a multi sport athlete or an athlete on various levels that we, again, educate. It's all about education for the athlete and the coaches and everyone involved in the athlete's care. Communication, education, those are all definitely important things. So what final tips would you provide for someone who maybe has sustained some kind of injury? How do they know when they need to seek intervention from a medical professional? So obviously that varies on the injury, but I think if you, for example, sustain an ankle sprain injury or roll your ankle, um, obviously if you've tried some icing and rest and elevation um, and you have a significant amount of swelling, you can't bear weight on it, you know, that certainly should be something that should get evaluated. So if things are not getting better, um, you know, in a reasonable time, you know, which I would say if you give it you know, a few days and you no, don't notice things are heading in the right direction, it's always best to get it evaluated. But again, it depends on the severity of the injury. If you have some significant trauma, obviously she, you should get that evaluated sooner and not sit on it um, versus something that may be more minor and you're, you know, give it a few days. And if it's not getting better, obviously get it evaluated. Great advice. Thank you, Dr. Words, for your insight into sports injuries and concussions and helping athletes return to play. Thank you to our viewers for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. In two weeks' time, our guest is Ryan Fitzgerald from Indiana University Bloomington, who will discuss collegiate intramural sports. We will see you then. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.